Well, Braid, thanks for coming into town. Yeah. I yeah. mean, how long did it take you to get here? Mm. Well, if you drive straight through, it takes about seven hours, but we made a couple stops. Oh, that's not bad. You're in yeah. Montana? Yep. We're at Montana. Western Montana. So we are about an hour from Missoula. Hmm. I'd say southeast of Missoula. So are you guys getting that cold snap right now? Yeah. Wednesday is supposed to be 25 below zero. Nice. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah, you can get a tan in that weather. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that cold snap, it's like a polar thing from Siberia. And Kalispell, a Andy Stumpf, I saw his, his low was negative 30. And this high was like negative 15 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, so I was curious in podcasting you for the Black Rifle Coffee podcast because I want people to know you. Because I think a lot of the things that you're doing are important, especially when it comes to educating women and hunting. And um, I want people to kind of understand where you come from. And then we can get into like what are you do what you're doing now, but you are the owner. Uh, is, is it owner? Founder. Founder. Mm -hmm. You are the uh, founder of what organization? Montana Grit Outdoors. Montana Grit Outdoors. Such a cool name. Yeah. Your name came up in a Google search query when I put in Montana. Nice. Montana <laughs> Grit <good>. Outdoors <laughs> populated. I was like, what? It actually happened this morning when nice. I was looking up Montana Knife Company's logo. I put Montana and Grit Outdoors came. I was like, oh, that's weird. I'm podcasting her today. That's a good deal that so, we come up on the top. It, that's good SEO. That means you yeah. have good search engine optimization. Uh, let's talk about the organization as far as what it does, and then let's talk about your background. Okay. Uh, so what we do right now, we are specifically providing guided hunts for women veterans, women of a Gold Star family, women who lost somebody to PTSD, mm -hmm. and women first responders. Mm. Um, so we provide these hunts all over the country, and what we do is we go and we hunt with an outfitter to create a relationship with them, mm. you know, because we want to continue to use the same people. So we basically vet them, and then when we bring these women to these outfitters, we know that they're safe, that they're going to connect with the mission. Um, we try to find female guides, mm. and then we tailor the hunt to to our hunter, like their personality, their toughness, mentally, physically, you know, what they can handle because, you know, not everybody can handle an elk hunt. Um, sometimes a deer hunt or something is more suitable. Mm. So, um, and everything down to the gear, we provide the gear, we provide the guns, the bows, the training, um, the knives, uh, and then we, we build the relationship with our participants up leading up to the hunt. So we try to plan them about a year or so in advance, mm. if we can, mm. so that we can get to know them, so that, you know, that trust is there. And then, you know, throughout the process of the hunt, I mean, you as a hunter, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to put into words what happens to you. You know, what you discover, you know, as a person, and a lot of these women have never hunted before. So it's a new thing, you know, they're stepping out of their comfort zones. It's intimidating. It can be scary, you know, it's, and I'm an avid hunter and sometimes I feel afraid, mm -hmm. you know, and it's gives them an opportunity to be proactive in through their fear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something that they can look back on. Um, and we also source emotional support um, because I've got the passion and I want to make sure that we are hitting on every possible aspect in healing that we can. Mm -hmm. Because each one of these women have a different experience, a different, um, whether it's grief, whether, you know, it's something that happened, you know. I mean, and you just never know what people have been through in their childhoods, you know. And then you intertwine that with, you know, like female veterans, you know, for example, sometimes they don't have a good experience. You know, um, Gold Star, you know, they, they have that loss and that grief. And then life that happens after that loss, they're still facing challenges, mm. you know. So, I mean, there's so many different things that you can pull from a hunt, you know, to help you realize, like, hey, I just did that. I can do this now, you know. Mm. I mean. Yeah, it's so, I think... 
when people have hangups about hunting because they're they don't understand the important relationship between hunting the experience and the resilience it builds in you after the process yeah it's not just about the hunt like the harvesting of the animal is one component but the planning the preparation mentally and physically the actual difficulty in the hunt exposure to the elements getting out in nature all the things yeah are part of that experience and now as a reference for the person who potentially has gone through trauma um they look at that experience and go man i did that like and and it continues it's not just one niche experience it continues even in the sustenance it provides for families for friends yeah. where you're breaking bread building relationships post hunt and sharing the experience that you just harvested the animal now you know second and third order effects that are positively impacting your life which is uh, obviously always good why the idea of doing this with uh, women only and then you've chosen first responders and veteran women, why, why that demographic of women? Well, um, first of all, there's just, there's not a lot of, I mean, you've got all these nonprofits, right? That mm. There's a lot. Yeah. I feel like they're starting to surface more with the hunting. Mm. Well, when it comes to women and hunting, okay, um, it's, I think it's delicate, you know, um, the intimidation of it. So I wanted to create a space where they could get the experience and feel confident when they do it, you know, because women need specifics, you know, um, every detail of the hunt. Like, we always want to know, like, where am I going to shoot it? What kind of gun? You know, all of that stuff that comes with the hunt. Like, I wanted, I wanted to create a place where we could build them up and prepare them to the best of our ability for the hunt itself. And I chose the women that I chose because I've always wanted to help people and I'm all about niches. You know, I'm always looking for those people that I would, that are less paid attention to, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I personally have never heard of really any programs for women in these categories. I mean, I've researched it, uh, and I also want them to know that they're seen, that, that somebody wants to support them and be there for them and to help them with what their needs are and to help them through their struggles. Mm. I went into a hunting camp recently with a woman, and everybody was like, you brought a girl to hunt camp? Like, it's not common, right? And, it's not. And there's this, I don't know, there's all this negative stereotype when it comes to women being in the hunting space because it's a guy thing it's a man's thing you know the hunters um, are men and the gatherers are women and when you see a lot of women hunting it's typically the the perception is that person's doing it for the persona but it's not actually what they do because they're doing it for the gram or whatever it is but i know a lot of women hunters i mean logan's girlfriend is an amazing talented hunter who do it for real who are yeah. who are just amazing human beings who don't need the affirmation they just do it because they want to do it and and that's right like you bring a young man into a hunting camp he won't ask one question because he doesn't want to feel stupid right and he doesn't want to be judged by other men you bring a woman into a hunting camp that doesn't understand what's going on she's in like hey what the hell is going on yeah like start educating me so yeah, yeah. i think it I think you're right on it. it there is a, a niche and there is a need. Why did you, let, let's talk about your background because I, I want to get to the point where we understand um, uh, the complexities of why you decided to go, on, go down this path. But where, where do you come from? Did you grow up hunting? Like what's your background? So I grew up in Phillipsburg, Montana. It's a town of 900. I mean, and it's the most beautiful little place just socked in the mountain. Um, my dad, you know, he would hunt. That's how we ate, you know? I mean, he would go out and shoot rabbits. And that's what we ate that day. You know, or if we went fishing for the day, that was dinner. That was dinner, yeah. You know, he would, we would backpack into uh, mountain lakes and I was little like, like your kids. I mean, and nobody carried me. 
I had to walk like seven miles in. And I remember coming out one time and my legs hurt so bad. I could, I was like limping, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just reached out, I'm like, okay, you know, and like the truck's right there. I'm like, I just can't cross this bridge, you know? <laughs> um, but so I grew up in the small town. Um, you know, I, I didn't get into hunting until I was in my 20s. Mm. And um, it just, I don't know, I just chose to start doing it. And I started going to hunting camp with my Uncle John. That's kind of where the passion rooted was with him. Mm. And we would ride horses, you know, seven miles in and hunt. And, um, but, you know, he was, he was a lot of fun to hunt with. But the specifics were never taught to me. Mm. And so I would just, you know, grab my gun and go. And, you know, I thought I was so cool sometimes. I'm like, yeah, this is badass. You know, I'm like <laughs> walking through the woods, you know, with my cousin. And we're going to go shoot something, you know. And we would never see anything because we're just like clomping. My cousin's always wearing jeans, so they're like scraping. By, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, that's my background. Um, I grew up with my grandmother. Mm. And she served in the army. Mm. Uh, my great my great grandfather served in the army. Um, my, I mean, I've got such a list. Like my uncle John, Desert Storm. Uh, my other uncle, he joined in '74, and he was a sniper for a little while. And I think it was the border of Thailand. They were like taking out smugglers or something like that. And mm. he also went to Iraq. Brother in Afghanistan, brother in Iraq, um, another uncle was in the guard. Uh, my grandfather was a survival instructor for the Air Force. Oh, wow. Um, so a lot of history, military yeah. history. And then my other grandfather was a military police. And then he was also the sheriff of the little town I lived in for a while. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, that's, and that's where the, you know, the target audience I chose kind of comes in because... I didn't realize how built into me that it is, like military, oh, first yeah. responder stuff. You're raised by military men. But yeah. nobody talked about it. I mean, I had no idea the experiences and the level and extent of, you know, the things that my family had went through in the military because literally nobody spoke to me about it. Wow. You know, so I just didn't know. Um, I just, I just didn't understand, like, you res this is why you respect people. This is why you respect the military and your law enforcement and stuff, and you respect your freedom and embrace it. You were just raised that way. You didn't have I to mean, be uh, told about it when you're raised that way, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I just, you know, but I wasn't taught about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, growing up with my grandmother, I mean, I just had no guidance. And I had no influences of right and wrong. So I just kind of went and did whatever, whatever I felt like it was survival for me. Mm. You know, it was like, if there was something I needed and wanted, I had to go get it, you mm. know? And I forgot to pay attention to the things around me and to the people that suffer and, you know, the realities of what actually happens in the world. And I was so sheltered, you know? So I decided I didn't want to be on the fence anymore. I like woke up. I'm like, holy crap. You know, people need help. Mm. You know, what was it? Was it? Was that an awakening from a personal experience, or was it just you're just like I think I need to do something about it? It was, yeah. It was just I don't know. I just woke up. There wasn't a specific experience, um, but it was more coming to the realization with age, the lack of respect that I had for people growing up, and the under and like how ignorant I was, just mm. because like I was so focused on my own survival. Mm. And my own self of like, okay, I have to work these jobs and pay my bills and buy clothes and food, you know. I mean, my gram, she did a good job taking care of us, but, you know, starting at like 15, I mean, I started buying my own clothes. I was working two jobs, you know, things like that. So I became just so self-focused on like surviving that, you know, I didn't realize like, hey, there is a world out there outside of Montana, and there are people that are in way worse positions than you are, you mm -hmm. know? So that's where, like, getting on, you know, when I decided to get off the fence and help these women, you know? So it's just kind of directed from um, just being so 
selfish growing up, you know, and I always, I was always kind, you know, and I always had compassion for people. I just didn't, I didn't know how to use it. I didn't like embrace it. Mm. So Montana Grit Outdoors stems from the desire to selflessly serve other people yeah. outside of yourself. Yep. And so when you, when you look at Montana Grit now, um, where are you guys at now? And what are the challenges that you face in a nonprofit amongst many nonprofits that exist in the country? Um, how are you guys doing now? So right now, we're in the process of um, organizing our first hunts, very first ever hunts that I'm so excited, uh, starting in September. So Kirsten, she's coming on the bear hunt with us. Oh, awesome. Yep. yep. And then... Kirsten is a um, female instructor for Phil Craft Survival who was in Charlotte uh, and worked as a law enforcement officer, SWAT officer, very accomplished human being when it comes to uh, training and competency yeah. in, tactical, in the tactical space. Um, and we, we even deal with the, the issues of her as a female being in that space because yeah. men are weak. Yeah. I mean, men are insecure about the role that she plays in that position. And it's like, she's a competent, like she, she's a SWAT officer. Like what else do I have to say? Like she's qualified in, in that position. And she's also a family gal and she's yep. a mom. Yeah, she's, she's a tough. wife. She's a and she's a great human being. So she that's is. so this will be her first hunt. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So And it's, it's a black bear hunt, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um it's with Lucky Strike Outfitters in Maine and the bears are baited because it's just so thick. I mean Yeah, and it's Maine. They're like yeah. there's so many there's so black many bear bears everywhere. Yeah. You don't want to be spot and stocked. Yeah. You <laughs> all don't. over the Maine you know? is crazy too. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so we've got her hunt we're putting together um, that's locked in. And then I've got a mother-daughter gold star hunt that we're setting up for an archery. It's going to be an elk and deer combo hunt in Montana. Awesome. Um, and, you know, the struggles that we face right now, it's building a team, um, getting volunteers. Um, you know, I've got three boys, you know, and, and I'm a wife, you know, so for me to do it all, like with the fundraising and everything, cause we're 100% donation based. I don't have the knowledge and the skill set to write grants and to try to, you know, get funding that way. So I rely on fundraising. Uh, and we're, personal, um, Donations, right? Yeah. Mm. Yep. And right now we're in the middle of building like a hunter preparedness series of courses that are just geared specifically for hunting, like a wilderness survival, you know, um, putting you in a situation where, you know, you have to build a fire from, you know, you got a lighter and, you know, what you have. Um, some stop the bleed stuff, you know, all the, the basic things like maps, big one. Land Basic nav, education yeah, land like nav, yeah. maps and compass, you know, because Onyx Maps is awesome. Don't rely on that, mm. you know, like your phone is going to, it gets cold, your phone dies, it might break, you might drop it. You got to know how to get the heck out of there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, our struggle right now is just finding help and, um, you know, putting these fundraisers together. You know, that concert I put on last year that I was telling you about, that was holy cow. Like that was a lot of work and it was hard, but it was, it paid off, you know? Yeah. Um, but we're doing well, you know, uh, things have been pretty consistent and the more I make connections and the more that I meet people and talk to people, you know, I'm a face person. Like I'm going to face you. I'm going to fly across the country to do a podcast to your face. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to just settle with a phone call. Like you need to shake my hand, you need to see my eyes, and you need to know that this is serious and I am gonna see this through and I'm gonna help these people. You know, I'm not just, we're not just another nonprofit. Yeah, I'm you know? laughing because I mean, this is true. Bree <laughs> does not mess around. Like, I don't mess around. Last time I saw you, you were in, you were in New Hampshire with me. Yeah. At SIG. Yeah. And then um, you're making the rounds and then I saw you before that, you were here in Salt Lake City for the hunting expo, right? Yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, you're just all over the place. You're, you're bouncing around, but you're doing the in-person interface, which is so important. Yeah. You can't accomplish anything and be successful without doing in-person engagements. Like yeah. if you want it to actually work, be willing to, to take the time and interpersonally engage. It's not, a text isn't good enough. No, people anymore. are busy, you yeah. know, and you have to like, you just have to keep showing up. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I like that. I mean, That's a perfect assessment of you. you if, where he just shows up. Yeah, I like if you show up and you face somebody. Yeah. How are they going to say no? No to you? You know, <laughs> yeah, or like, like how are too. they going to not want to talk to you? It's so true. <laughs> That's so true. And I can't say no to Bree. I, I, we 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 have some stuff uh, lined out for the future and, and some projects. I actually think the idea that you're doing right now of providing education is important because so many nonprofits. They want to do this all the time. They're like, give me the whatever. Yeah. Right? And the problem with that, I mean, the, besides. It's not reliable. It's not. And, and besides the psychology of human beings, like you need a value proposition. Yeah. You need to provide some kind of value that helps people to understand like the impact that you're going to have. So if, yeah. it's, if it's, hey, we are helping these people and you could be part of that process, that story needs to be told. If it's, hey, we're going to provide you with free education to get you started in this journey and providing value back and investing in us and giving a donation yes. helps provide them with the experience. Yep. That's part of the story. That's what yeah. you need to do. So yeah, like these, the courses that we're gonna do that are geared, we wanna do it year round just so we can keep that, um, the funding consistent, you know, and then people will learn who we are. You know, because we get to talk about the nonprofit, you know, in the present, the original presentation before the class starts, mm. you know, so it gives people an opportunity. And then like all our gear and stuff that we sell, like our, um, like our hoodies and, and our hats and our t-shirts, you know, that all goes right back into the organization. Like really I, cool. Yeah. Cause I don't get paid. Like yeah. this rides on my husband's back. Yeah, because he's, you know? he's breadwinning right now. He is. And you're doing the nonprofit, managing yeah. it as a wife and a mother of three boys. Yeah, I mean, I give him mad props yeah. because he works hard jobs, you know? Yeah. He busts his ass. Yeah. And then yeah. supports me, you know? That's awesome. So, and it can't be easy for him. I mean, there's things he doesn't say, but that's okay, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. So. Well, that's that's what this is all about. Like, the one of the reasons I want to have you on the podcast is to talk about the story, but to also tell the story because it's important for people to invest back into, I, I think personally, veteran advocacy. A lot of people say, well, Mike, a lot of people need help. Yes, I understand a lot of people need help, but veterans who have uh, an experience likely in war or just trauma period don't have a lot of help, period. I mean, my veteran affairs insurance, because I'm 100% uh, total and permanent is veteran affairs and the VA hospital is trash. Yeah. And a lot of veterans have no help to get treatment that's so yeah. desperately needed. So it's not like you can go to like one of these top tiered health uh, organizations that are going to provide you with somebody to see, they're going to put you on a waiting list. Like I got a, yeah. I got recently told, from the veteran affairs system in Utah, which is very surprising because they're, they're one of the better ones. My next physical is in November. I said, I want an annual physical. They're like, yeah, see you next year. Like, hmm? how many veterans <laughs> are there in Utah? There can't be a lot of us. Yeah. And it's all this small stuff, but it adds up, especially when we're dealing with a mental health crisis um, like we've never seen in history, right? Black Rifle Coffee Company wants to send off the year with one final epic sale. From December 27th through January 3rd, save up to 70% on select products so you can end your 2022 with some savings. Shop all the best Black Rifle apparel with the patriotic designs you know and love, plus many you haven't seen before. Make saving money on coffee your New Year's resolution by joining the Coffee Club for half off your first month. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com and start the new year right with these epic savings on America's coffee. Let's talk about the process that you utilize uh, in hunting and, and kind of mentoring a woman who's never hunted before. Because I wouldn't even know where to begin with somebody who has never hunted. I mean, Kirsten's a great example, like a bear hunt. 
she obviously needs to be educated on all the things that a bear can do, how to hunt, the specifics of the equipment. What's the process start? How do you start that uh, process? Is there is there a, uh, an interview process? Is there an application? Like, walk me through the process. Yeah, yeah. So that's another thing we're kind of struggling with a little bit right now is the vetting. Um, but there is an application process, interview process, and then I want to meet in person. Yeah. You know, so if I need to go to them, I will go to them. What's the problem with, uh, talk to me about the struggle with the vetting process. I assume it, you mean it's hard to identify. Well, it's hard, like, so I, you know, I'm not going to be the one doing all the vetting. Like, I need professionals that can read into it and know, like, okay, how to, like, guide me in choosing the applicants. Yeah. Yeah, because you could have, I mean, I always think it's crazy when uh, there was this, I won't name their names, there was this nonprofit that used to take guys out and do all these extreme sports. And I'm like, if you want to help a person who's dealing with physiological issues because of trauma, mental trauma, then doing a base jump is probably not going to help them get through their situation. No. So dealing with guns, taking the life of something, you have to be cautious with that, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's the vetting, and then, you know, we, um, like, taking them on the hunt itself, they need to be prepared with a skill set. You know, we're not going to just throw them into this hunt and be like, okay, you know, like leading up to it, you know, we're going to learn like, okay, what, what is their skill set right now? Mm. And then build off of that skill set. So like if they need training mm. for hunting or not hunting, sorry, shooting, um, stuff like that, I want to make sure that we set them up where they live if mm. we can with somebody that can shoot with them and train with them. But that's also going to be carefully chosen, you know, mm. because we can't throw them in there with some, you know, because we all know there's arrogance in sh shooting instruction and stuff. <laughs> like, you know, that happens. <laughs> like you throw, <laughs> so no, like, no, I mean, no. we don't want to start the process off yeah. just, f that's, that's the number one fail right there if you do that. Like if you throw one of these women in with some strange instructor, you know, that's gonna build bad habits and make them uncomfortable. So, you know, we'll make sure that whoever they're paired with for training is legit. You know, you know that's where I'm going to vet those people as well, mm. all the way through the process. So they'll get training with shooting, um, like straight six archery and Bozeman. The mother-daughter gold star gals, straight six archery, had offered to help them with their training with their bows. Mm. And then I'll be able to go along and um, do the training with them at first. And then, you know, if it feels good and it's comfortable. And, they, and they're great dudes. I can already tell, mm -hmm. you know, that if they were to go on their own, then it would be okay. And then I've got another gal who I'm talking to, um, her name is Kate Pate. Have you heard of her? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I reached out to her because we need the emotional support and she lives in Bozeman. Oh, really cool. You know, so. She's great for that. Yeah, yeah. and I was like, hey, if, if this works out and we get this set up, how would you feel about, you know, going on one of the training classes with these gals and shooting with them. Mm. Because if we bring her in for their emotional support, then she's also building the relationship with them and trust. Uh, you know? So you're not, when you choose the outfitter, which is probably, I mean, I've been with outfits that, man, even nonprofits that have outfitters they use where they have no idea how this works. Like, let me give you a good, good example. Uh, an outfitter that works with a nonprofit and the outfitter is getting the hunters boozed up because that's their normal routine. Like, hey, let's just crush some whiskey. Like, well, somebody yeah. suffering from trauma doesn't need to crush whiskey isolated somewhere in the middle of the woods right. to tell their traumatic events over um, being alcohol-induced, which is very dangerous. Like, it's a recipe. 
So a lot of the outfitters don't have an understanding of like, hey, this is something you have to treat with cautious hands. So I assume you're guiding the person while the outfitter is guiding the hunt. Is that how it's working? Well, I go and I hunt there first before mm. we take anybody to the outfitter. Yeah. Me and as soon as I build more of a team, you know, we'll send somebody to that outfitter to hunt there. Yeah. To stay there, see what the lodging is like, the food, the terrain, the interaction, the interaction with the guides themselves, the experience as a female on that particular hunt. So that builds the relationship with us and the outfitter as well, because we'll continue to use those same outfitters. Mm. You know, and and like I said, it's going to depend on like each hunter is going to be, you know, there's going to be a different fit of a hunt for each hunter if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, um, it makes sense. Yeah. So, um, you know, like I'm going to go to Colorado next fall and do a hunt with, uh, he or not Heroes Harvest. Well, he runs Heroes Harvest. Uh, it's Rugged Mountain Outfitters mm -hmm. in Colorado. And he also runs a nonprofit called Heroes Harvest where, you know, they do what we do, but just for, you know, men and women both around the country too. Mm. And, um, Kate Pate, Kate had actually put me in touch with him. And so he had offered to let me do an elk hunt there. Mm -hmm. And so they do like wall tents and they have horses and stuff. So to go there and just see like, okay, this is what this is like with this wall tent. This is the terrain. This is the experience. This was my interaction with these guys. So then I'll know how to pair, like say, you know, if the relationship is built, if they're good, a good fit, for what we're looking for, then I can take, you know, the right person on this hunt that can handle that, mm. you know, cause not everybody can handle an elk hunt. Yeah. I mean, it's just so mental and so physical. And sometimes like you get into these areas, <laughs> mm. you know, and it's like, it's, you get that feeling in your chest, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, not everybody's ready for that, Yeah, you know, versus like going on a whitetail hunt or, mm. you know, like a mule deer hunt or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what is you what have you have what have you learned from your personal experience through hunting? What is the thing for you? Like I mean obviously you've created that connection. I kind of have my own little answer, but it's like what is the thing for you personally that you go, man, other people need to experience this? The commitment mm -hmm. um definitely hmm. like sticking with it when you're scared. Mm -hmm. Because most of my hunts that I do, I do them by myself. Um, I have a hard time with childcare. So my husband and I will switch on and off, you know. Um, and then, you know, or my dad will drop me off somewhere and he'll have the boys in the, in the, because he's got this old blazer. It's, it is awesome. But it's like just huge and the boys just jump all over that thing, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then he'll go drive around and wait for me and pick me up, you know, on this other area after so long, you know, and, um, there's just this sense of like, just vulnerability mm. and, you know, cause I'm not very big. Okay. I'm like a snack size for a fricking predator, mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm. know? And so what I take away from it is just truly like pushing through fear and being uncomfortable. Um, and sometimes you get cold, but it's like, nope, I'm still going. You know, I'm cutting these tracks. I'm going to follow them. I'm going to figure it out. I mean, I have chased so many bulls this year and nothing connected. Mm. I mean, I, I went on, let's see, Sunday, a couple days ago. That was day 40 between this year and last year that I elk hunted wow. and didn't connect. But I got into so many elk. I was within, you know... 50 yards of them, but there was no bulls mm. and I didn't have a cow tag. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the patience and getting through the giving up, it just not choosing to give up when you get that feeling of like, this just isn't going to work. You know, I'm just going to go back. Mm. Well, I never did that. And I went out muzzle loader. You know, I was determined. I'm like, I got two days to do the muzzle loader hunt. Because, you know, in Montana, you've got your five-week rifle season after bow season. And then there's like a gap, you know, like a two-week gap or something. And then 
muzzle loader season starts mm. and that's like 10 days long. Well, I couldn't find childcare throughout the week. So I had to wait for the weekend when my husband was off work. And so he stayed home with the boys while I hunted mm. both days, you know, and, and I had that sense of just like, gosh, and both days, not a fresh track. There was an elk highway from two days before that, you know, I mean, there were so many elk in there and it just, you know, and I still hit it differently and tried and, but you know, every, I stood there this year though. And I looked up at the ridge and just was like, when I was gonna, cause that was it. The sun was going down, there was nothing. And I just looked at it and I just like had this sense of like peace, you know, like, okay. I learned more in this hunting season than I did last time. And it was like, a, it was like the perfect closing moment for me, mm. you know? And I came to the realization of like, you know, I wasn't upset and, and I had put so much time and effort into it. And I chased so many elk and just could not get it to connect, but I accepted it because that's what elk hunting is. Mm. You know, and the more that you go through that and the more you do that, eventually you will have a harvest every year. Yeah. Because you're going to look back and be like, okay, this is what I need to change. This is why this didn't work out, mm. you know, and then learning the areas that I did because like scouting is a big deal, but I don't get to do it much because I'm a mom and I run this nonprofit. So I wing it, mm. <laughs> but I know the area, you know, like just surrounding where I hunt, just in, in general, you know, usually I'm finding fresh tracks every hunt usually, you know, it's just a matter of knowing how to track them. And then sometimes the snow, like my biggest struggle was the snow this year because it was like sugary. Mm. So you can't tell which way they're going. Like you really have to freaking study that track, you know, mm. and then it's like, it looks big. And then all of a sudden you like, get under a tree where there's not so much snow and it's a freaking deer track. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, what's well, amazing how, I mean, what you just, just des described is most people don't want to do, you know, most people are lazy. Yeah. You know, like the statistic right now is one in five Americans are diagnosed right now with a mental health disorder. I think it's more than that. And it's 50% over a lifetime, but I think it's more than that. And I think if you actually, a ask people in general, and there's a couple of surveys that have been done, the majority of, especially Americans, are suffering from depression, anxiety, or something. But when they have the time off, because they have to cross load their kids to their spouse, they'll choose to go get their nails done. They'll choose to go drink beer with their buddies. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but they won't choose to get out in nature, you know, hit the reset button, and get where we belong. You know, like the resilience and, and exposure that we experience as human beings today was life 60, 70, 100 years ago. It was just the norm. Yeah. And we've lost yep. all of that connection with nature, which is obviously leading to, um, you know, everything. I mean, uh, drug overdoses, 100,000 people. I even think 40,000 people in car accidents a year is equated to us not paying attention because we're so focused on our phones yeah. and part of the mental health challenge. Yeah. So when you take human beings, like especially that are, you know, have profound stories, profound experiences in their lives, um, and you get them out there, it changes and rewires everything. And yeah. it's, it's the only place where I want to be, which is why I have all the reminders of where I want to be surrounding me because you know it's a reminder of getting as close to what i love the most which is outdoors in nature and and living that experience yeah you know, that reflection yeah um and embracing the suck yeah and embracing the you suck. know like yeah the cold like this this last weekend mm. when i was hunting i mean it was cold this like is it, a solo hunt well this last weekend my friend sarah went with me on Saturday, mm -hmm. but I went by myself on Sunday. And I mean, I got cold, like, but I remember getting to the top of the ridge and I looked back at Sarah and I was like, I love this so much that it hurts. And I'm just shivering and like still 
Like there's a chance. There's a chance I'm going to see an elk today, you know? Yeah. And it just, man, it was cold. It sucked. And we sat there, you know, and um, had something to eat too. And just, you know, we, we were, we didn't start a fire just because we knew we had to get back down to the truck soon and there just wasn't time for it. And I was sitting there and I told myself, like, man, put, put yourself through this. Be cold. It's mm. okay. Mm. Like resilience is such an important thing. Mm. And that's, to me, I was building my own resilient, resilience by sitting there, eating the meal, instead of getting up and moving right away because I was so cold, but I needed the energy from the food, mm -hmm. you know? But a part of me just wanted to be like, screw that, let's keep walking. Mm. But I chose to sit there and embrace the suck, mm. you know, because it sucks. And if you don't go through it, next time when you get really cold like that, it's gonna just keep getting worse for you, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's how so, disasters happen because they yeah. compound. That, well, something you said that's really impactful and important to talk about is commitment. And a lot of people, you know, whether it's business advice and leadership advice or any form of success requires a level of commitment. And if you want to be successful in anything, you have to be willing to commit, whether that's relationships or crushing a business. And so... A lot of people don't want to commit to the hunt because it's hard. Yeah. Right? It, like even when you look at the preparation of getting your tags. Yeah. What a nightmare. I mean, I talked to Eastman's Journal. Uh, the guys from Eastman's are good friends of ours. And the tag process, which they're trying to refine, is a pain in the ass. But a lot of people would look at that and because we don't have resilience built into us anymore, they get a couple of scrolls in. They're like, dude, this is too complicated. I'm done. Yeah. Like, I'm out. And so guys are like, well, it must be nice being to hunt all these amazing places. I'm like, dude, I just went duck hunting and got an over-the-counter tag online and showed up at Salt Lake City. Yeah. Like I was, I could see the highway. <laughs> like, like I filled my duck tag, my duck <laughs> limit, and ate dinner with my family sharing duck with them, and I could see the highway. I'm like, it's not that hard. You just have you, to do it. You just have to do it. <laughs> just do but it. But people don't want to do it. How, how is, um, what, is the, what does that mean for you when you say commitment um, as it relates to your clients that you're taking on hunts? What, what do you think that will benefit them for those women who potentially haven't been there before or, or been committed to something like that? Well, they have to choose. They have to make a choice. Are you going to see this hunt through? Even when it sucks, because it's gonna suck. Mm. That's the beauty of the entire thing, is the fear. Mm. Getting through the fear, the intimidation, and feeling you know, vulnerable, um, making a choice through it. Are you going to act? Are you going to you know, keep hiking up this mountain um, when, you know, not everybody's going to have a harvest. And sometimes you won't even see anything. It just depends on the hunt and how it's going to go. But once you do get up on that animal, what kind of decision are you going to make? Mm. Are you going to choose to shoot or are you going to choose not to? If you don't choose to shoot, then that's okay. You're here. You did this. You made it. You're looking at the trophy, mm. not the trophy. You know, I don't look at them as trophies. Mm. I look at them as like a blessing, like a gift, you know? Mm. So are you gonna do what it takes to take this life? Or are you going to just soak it in? Montana grit. That's where the grit comes from. It's where the grit comes from. Oh, I just figured that out. It just makes sense to me at the end of the podcast. It just like occurred to me. <laughs> Montana grit. You have to have the grit. I, the most difficult things I've done in my life have not been the military. They've been hunts. Yeah. Backcountry hunt, hunting. Now, somebody, I just got back from an Iowa hunt and <laughs> I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I, there was a, 
I had three dough tags, and I just went there for the meat. And we were in a, um, what are the things that you hot, yet you're in that you like a, a blind? blind? It was like a blind, yeah. but it's like a one of the contraptions, the built ones. And guys, I don't like it. I grew up tree stand hunting in in spots in North Carolina, like f- hunting from a stand. But to be into like a like a little place that has a heater, yeah, it has a window, <laughs> has a radio, and you could like drink beer and hang out. Don't drink beer and hunt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the guys like, hey, you got three doe tags. And so I'm scouting, and it's raining, and it's cold. And I look down, and there's three doe standing next to each other. And he's like, all right, Mike, let's get on the... And I'm like, boom, boom, boom. And I take three shots. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what'd, you, what'd you do? And I dropped all three doe <laughs> instantly. Nice. And he's like, what? Like, did you just kill all three of those de- de- uh, deer? And I'm like, dude, this is like, is this hunting? Because I don't feel like we're hunting. No, you're feel, you're not really. I feel like we're not hunting here. Well, I take that. I mean, it's yeah. hunting to some people. It is hunting. It it's is. harvesting more than it's hunting. Yeah. Because that compared to a backcountry elk hunt, where this guy came from, yeah, um, is completely different. It you is. don't need a lot of grit to sit. I mean, it did get hot at one point where I had to zip down my Sika jacket because I'm like, <laughs> ooh, man, this is not, I'm not feeling well. And so I did t- take grit getting through that. Um, but it did take a lot of grit to get through the hunt. But backcountry hunting, especially solo, yeah, a lot of men won't solo a backcountry hunt. It, it takes a lot of grit to do that. And yeah. that experience is the most beautiful experience you'll ever experience, likely in life. I mean, the alternatives are like doing a epic solo adventure throughout the world, you know, in an international travel. But that is the way to do it if you want to live a profound experience in life. Well, and the reason I solo hunt, first of all, it is so hard to find childcare, <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and I mean, I don't, you know, there's not a lot of females to hunt with. Yeah. And, um... I also, I also think about like my capabilities, Mm. like what, how far can I actually go? You know, like I don't push myself to a dangerous limit, Mm -hmm. but harvesting an animal by yourself, like knowing like if something happened to my husband, because, you know, he works hard jobs, you, you know, and sometimes he works dangerous jobs. And if something happened to him, I would have that built into me already. Like, okay, this is my routine. When I'm on my own, I can do this. I can bring this home to my family. I can bring my boys out and then I can teach them how to do this. Interesting. You know, so that they can, um, you know, feed their families so that they don't, they have something to rely on that's built into them because they already watch me do it. You know, they are always deer hunting with me. I mean, I take them out by myself and I shoot the deer with them, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, like this year they watched me drop a knee and shoot my buck at 150 yards, one shot. Like they went up there and they helped me gut it. You know, they'll like hold the legs or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, they like to pick up the organs and stuff like they'll take the heart and they're just so proud, you know, and to Mm -hmm. them, it's just that is their normal. You know, so for me, it's like, okay, being out there by myself and harvesting an animal on my own, that is self-reliance. Like I am not having to rely on anybody to take me hunting or to help me get meat. You know, Um, obviously in situations with an elk, yeah, you need help getting it out, but there are plenty of people that will help me. And if I can't find help, then I will debone it and I will take as many trips as it takes to pack it out. Mm. You know, I mean, you can do it. It's totally doable. And I'm not very big. Like I've been looking into uh, like snatch blocks and stuff. I just can't find one small enough and light enough <laughs> for my pack. Like if I had to like move it, mm-hmm. like if it, if it lands like downhill on a tree or something, or, you know, I need to move it to get it gutted, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. Um, I've been trying to think of like a pulley system I can use that is light enough to make sense to have to carry it around 
you know, because I've always got rope and stuff, but sometimes it's a situation. <laughs> yeah. You know? I already thought about that, those considerations. For, yeah. For, especially as a solo um, person, when you have to try to pack out all those considerations, make you yeah. more resilient because they're just problem solving. You know, like you, yeah. like most people who encounter problems, they just quit. But why not problem solve and learn along the way? And hunting's the best way yeah. to do that, by the way. Yeah. Um, Bree, where, where can people find all the amazing things that you do? Like, where is your main, I, I see you active on a couple platforms. Mm -hmm. Where are you active on? Um, so, you know, we've got Facebook, we've got Instagram. Um, it's, if you look up Montana Grit Outdoors, you'll find us. Uh, we've got our website, montanagritoutdoors.com. Uh, but that's where I lack help too, is uh, like the marketing. That's mm. like the number one issue that I have right now. Mm. I mean, we do so many amazing things, you know, and we get to meet so many amazing people, like being here with you guys, you know, and having this experience. Like, it would be great to show the world, like, okay, we're making progress. You know, we're doing what it takes to get our name out there and to show people that we're real, mm. you know, and that we are just trying to help. Mm -hmm. So if people do give to us, they know that they're giving to something that is genuine. Mm. Where can people, do you have an email that people can email? Like, yeah. oh, there's a lot of expertise here. Yeah. Uh, people who listen to Black Rifle Coffee's podcast, I already got feedback from the last veteran podcast I did with um, uh, Two Wolves Foundation. They are, they're already getting lined out with a lot of opportunities from the podcast. So thank you guys for, for being part of that. Um, if you know people that can help, contact or leave the comments below. But is there a direct email that people can yes. go to? What so is it? So it's montanagritoutdoors at gmail.com. Okay. So we'll link that below. And if you want to click that link and help out, I know you, a lot of you guys are uh, talented marketing people. And uh, if you want to donate or help out in any way, all the links will be down below. Bree, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and telling your story. Yes. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, it means a lot, you know, to, because there's, you know, you, <clears throat> you all have such a great follow, you know, and there's a lot of like-minded people out there that watch your podcasts and everything. And uh, we just want people to know, like, we are here to help and support, build relationships, um, and just be there for those that, that really need somebody. So we are, we're huge supporters of our first responders, our veterans, their families. Um, we get behind that, you know, there's, there's such a need in that area. And there's so many people that just don't understand what that need is. Um, and they don't know, um, you know, that we need to come together as a community mm -hmm. in this country you know, civilians and back our first responders and our veterans up and their families, mm. you know? I mean, and we choose women too that lost somebody to PTSD because to me, you know, they, they're they grieving in the same way. Like that person suffered, Yeah. you know, in war and afterwards, you know? And so the family is still here, you know, there's, there's just so much unjust in some of this stuff, you know? So giving them a space to find closure with that instance that happened that you can't change, you know, cause you're still here and you still have to keep going. Mm. So. Yeah. Thank you so much guys. Yeah. yeah thank you for uh, listening or watching. Make sure you subscribe, hit that notification tab so you can get notified. And uh, thank you for joining us. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy!